Time for some Mario Golf. Well, that sets my net worth to... One coupon to Joystick Burger. Gaming is a fairly expensive hobby. You have to buy a multi-hundred dollar console, controllers, extra controllers for when those inevitably break, internet services, storage for games developers can't be bothered to compress, for the love of God, why do these keep breaking? And then of course, you have the games. If you're looking to play the hottest new releases, you better be ready to fork over 60, <clears throat> 70 dollars. Now that isn't to say all games are this expensive. Tons of games hit the shelves at different price points, and if you're willing to wait, any game not made by Nintendo will eventually go on sale. You also have indie masterpieces that often cost less than a burger. Seriously, the prices here are outrageous. But when you're looking for games cheaper than dirt, you can always check the good old free games section. These games won't break the bank because it's already broken. I can repeatedly click download with only moderate fear. Now, there's an important distinction here between free games and demos. Demos only allow you to play a small slice of an overall experience, while free games let you download the base game itself, usually offering in-game purchases or additional portions of the game behind paywalls. I also won't be talking about the free offers from Nintendo Switch Online, since those games obviously are only free with a paid subscription. So, now that my Switch is loaded with poverty, let's jump right into the world of free games. Jump Rope Challenge is a bite-sized exercise game that Nintendo devs whipped up in 2020. The small project was likely a way for the team to adjust to working entirely from home. You play as a jump roping bunny who will simply skip rope as you do so with the Joy-Cons. It's designed to be a short daily workout activity, tracking your progress as you go from jump rope veteran to jump rope expert. There's even various costumes you can dress your bunny in, including many of your favorite Nintendo characters. This game was an adorable excuse to keep people active while indoors and stop the spread of Ligma. Super Kirby Clash is an upgraded version of Team Kirby Clash Deluxe, which was an upgrade of the Team Kirby Clash subgame from Kirby Planet Robobot. They are really biding their time as they work on that next Kirby game. In this Kirby RPG, you'll take on quests with fellow Kirbys, taking down familiar and unfamiliar bosses. These other Kirbys can either be CPUs, or you can join other players online, who will fuel your inferiority complex. Boss fights have always been a highlight of the Kirby series, so getting a game that's an ongoing gauntlet is pretty cool. You can switch between four different classes, being the Sword Hero, Beam Mage, Hammer Lord, or Dr. Healmore. Upgrades and progression of the story are heavily reliant on gem apples and vigor respectively. These currencies are how they slow your progress and try to tempt you into spending real world cash. I'm not a huge fan of a Kirby game incorporating a system like this. Kirby is a series I usually sit down and play to relax, and knowing Kirby's after my credit card info is just a little unsettling. Especially when the store is run by Magalore, who is the last person I'd trust with my money. The game is fairly generous with currencies early on, but that's really only the game's way of, quite literally in this case, sucking you in. And I am not about to fall for- HOLY SH**! IS THAT NIGHTMARE?! Do you take IOUs? Pokemon Quest turns these Pokemon into adorable and sometimes horrifying block monsters. Why this art style? Because... mobile game, I guess? The game released on console before mobile, but... yeah, it's definitely a mobile game. The gameplay is essentially Pokemon Rumble, but now instead of controlling the Pokemon themselves, you command your team as if you're a Pokemon trainer. While this gameplay stays more true to Pokemon as a franchise, it's definitely less engaging when you have to sit back and watch your Bulbasaur get sent to the ER. As you travel across the lands, you'll collect ingredients for new dishes, which will lure in new Pokemon to your team. More warriors will watch die on the battlefield. This cycle continues until you realize you could be playing literally anything else. An overwhelming amount of the free games you see on storefronts today belong to the Battle Royale and Team Battle genres. There are a ton of these I could obviously talk about, but I don't think there's anything I could say about Fortnite that some five-year-old hasn't already said. So for the most part, I'm going to be glossing over most of the gigantic ones that everyone already knows and talk about some of the lesser known ones. Super Bomberman R Online is a 64 Bomberman Battle Royale, with the gameplay and graphics ripped straight from the Switch launch title, Super Bomberman R. I 
paid $60 for this. I'm glad there's at least a way to play Bomberman R online, since I remember the online servers for the Switch release being fairly deserted shortly after launch. This game just makes sense. There are tons of series jumping on the Battle Royale trend, but if there's one that fits the bill, it's gotta be Bomberman since, you know, it's always been a Battle Royale. All 64 players are divided up into 16 classic Bomberman arenas. These individual battles will ensue for a short period until the gates are lifted, allowing players to safely move between arenas, while those on the edges get removed from play. You can either end up in the arena with very few players, or way too many. Over time, things get more and more hectic as the remaining players who have acquired a slew of items are causing major destruction to the arenas. And of course, by the end, there will only be one Bomberman remaining. Or, you know, Snake. Real one-man army. Checking out the shop, I found the Bean Bomber, and he's right in my price range. So yeah, this game does a great job expanding the scope of your typical Bomberman battle. Unfortunately, however, being broke means I'm not allowed to perform the air guitar emote. Knockout City. This game was shown off in the February 2021 Nintendo Direct. It had all these wacky characters and art styles, none of which are in the game. Instead, the game goes for a cartoony punk style, which is fine, just kind of generic in my opinion. The game itself, however, has a pretty unique twist on the typical squad battle formula. That twist being dodgeball. Dodgeballs will be spread across the arenas, and your team will need to throw, catch, pass, and dodge your way to victory. Given its sport of choice, the movement is what was going to make or break this game. And luckily, I think they pulled it off. You have a wide variety of moves you can string together to weave, dodge, and set up your shots. And when you do land a shot, you get that oh-so-satisfying feedback. This game really surprised me. Everything from the team mechanics to the stage designs kept me invested. It's genuinely a fun game, which I never thought I'd say about something EA put out. But with EA, of course, comes a catch. Being that your visit to Knockout City will be locked behind a paywall once you reach level 25. From what I played, though, that point seems pretty far off so I'll definitely be revisiting this one from time to time. Ninja Does anyone remember this game? Back when it was revealed, it seemed to garner a lot of attention, thanks in no small part to its clear Splatoon inspiration. Then it was released as a free-to-play title, and... I never heard a peep. Two teams of ninja kids armed with bubblegum will be thrown into an all-out brawl. Alright, I'm ready. You'll need to use your gum, weapons, and special moves to send your opponents sticking to the walls. The combat system has a bit of depth to it, but no aspect of it was really grabbing me. Exchanges with other players got repetitive really quickly, and I think part of that comes down to how isolated the battles feel. In a game like Splatoon, you and your team are always shooting ink, which drastically changes your environment and abilities, ultimately impacting how each battle will play out. No exchange will ever be exactly the same. In Ninjala, however, once you get locked into a battle, it can really only end in so many ways. The only interesting interactions with the environment I saw were the ability to run on walls and the ability to turn into statues, which, while cool, just didn't feel like enough. The game keeps getting more seasons and updates, so there's clearly a player base somewhere, right? There's a good amount of content here, clearly. Just nothing that's really enticing me to come back. Fallout Shelter. Never thought I'd see a Fallout game on a Nintendo system, but here we are. We even get to pick our own vault number and... Oh. It's a tower management game. We build rooms, bring in survivors, and spend lots of time waiting for progress bars to fill. I hate this. Also by Bethesda is Elder Scrolls Blades. <laughs> I hate this. Can I just ask why developers feel the need to put their mobile games on Switch? Like yeah, the Switch is a portable system, but it's undoubtedly part of the console market. The mobile game market revolves around these smaller experiences because that's all they're really capable of running well at this point in time. Who is going to spend their time playing Elder Scrolls Blades on a system that can play games like Breath of the Wild or, I don't know, The Elder Scrolls? You would have to be a complete idiot to...
Welcome to Brawlhalla! Brawlhalla is a platform fighter in the same vein as Super Smash Bros, with its own cast of zany characters. Each character has its own weapon classes that are activated by picking up weapons that land on stage. Your starting roster is only a fraction of what the game has to offer, and you'll have to purchase other fighters with currency you slowly accumulate from your matches or from real transactions. The lineup of crossovers here is just bizarre. You got video game characters like Shovel Knight and Lara Croft, cartoon characters like Finn and Jake, and then just real people like The Rock and John Cena. These will haunt my dreams. Your movement options vary slightly from that of Smash Bros, but your attacks still revolve around two forms, in this case being standard and strong attacks. I don't think this will surprise anyone, but the roster just kinda lacks a variety of the Smash cast, and even other platform fighters. A lot of movesets feel nearly identical with the weapon class system, which makes the gameplay lose its charm really quickly. Stages similarly just don't do enough to mix up the formula. Overall, the game feels like a heavily watered down Smash experience, which is to be expected for the price and budget, but who doesn't already own Smash at this point? Brawlhalla does have Rayman though, so they're pretty much equals. Asphalt 9 There were 9 of these? This is your typical racing game with some burnout crashes and a few fantastical elements mixed in. The computers are actually fairly competent, so even early on, the game asks you to make the most out of these special mechanics. You progress race to race, unlocking new cars and advertisements to shove in your face. Absolutely disgusting, this is why I stick to Mario Kart. I'm sorry, but there's just nothing that stands out about this game. And I know all about standing out. I'm a white guy who talks about video games on the internet. Color Zen is a relaxing color-based puzzle game. You'll combine matching colored figures to spread hues across your screen, with the goal being to finish with the color indicated by the border. If you're looking for a low-stress game with enough color to up your dopamine, this is probably for you. If you're colorblind and looking for a real challenge, this is also probably for you. Trove takes the Minecraft aesthetic and turns it into an action RPG. So Minecraft Dungeons. Unlike those games, however, you'll be dropped into a community of players, MMO style. You'll battle enemies, collect treasures, build your base, level up, go on quests, craft items, and see what carnage is going on in chat. While I don't think there's anything wrong with using the block-based art style of games like Minecraft, the lack of details and textures in the world makes everything feel really generic and uninspired. The online features are really the coolest element this game has going for it, and even then, that is limited by the small player base and the lack of optimization on Switch. The game is also sure to remind you throughout your playthrough that this is indeed text. Ooh, a retro 80s aesthetic. That takes me back. Retro Great Arena is a top-down shooter where all your movement is dictated by your shots. You shoot to give yourself momentum, and you'll target your opponents in hope of blasting them into the red neon barriers. The pacing is heavily dictated by what ammo you pick up, so sometimes things will get really intense and exciting, and then screech to a grinding halt for a solid 10 seconds. There's some interesting ideas here and there, but it's nothing too remarkable. So we got that in common. Sky, Children of Light by That Game Company Inc. Review by That YouTube Gamer. This adventure title drops you into this gorgeous world of lively light and bleak darkness. Your character will traverse the skies, seeking souls in need of your spark. The story has a surprising amount of dialogue and nuance, and I just sat there as it all went right over my head. You really feel like you're dropped into another world, with an important role to play in its future. The gameplay itself is never really that dynamic, mostly boiling down to press button to light item, or press button to activate cutscene. The value here really comes from the journey. Oh yeah, they also made journey, and taking in all the beautiful environments. As pretty as everything is though, you can still see it's a low budget show here and there. If you're looking to escape to a world of wonder, walking long distances, and emote trees, look no further. Seriously, don't. The draw distance just can't handle it. Okay, up to this point, things have been fairly tame. But of course, when you jump down the rabbit hole of worthlessness, you're gonna find some weird shit. So, proceed with caution. Who, who is he talking to?
Tennis 1920s, for the man that was born a century too late. We create our character from a selection of ugly presets. How did they know? The gameplay is not like Wii Tennis like I originally presumed. You actually need to aim your shots and wind up for a proper swing. There's a lot of complexity here for a game that nobody's ever going to play. As we train, we level up our stats to make us a better player. It was either that or steroids. This was cheaper. My next opponent is my identical twin, Family Account, which must have been a popular name back then. The game will only let you play a few matches each day, so eventually you'll have to stop. What a shame. Angry Bunnies, Colossal Carrot Crusade. That's right, these bunnies are pissed and are venting their anger in the only way they know how. Ripping off Angry Birds. Grab those carrots, smash those boxes, and kill those foxes. Utilize bunnies with special abilities like speed boost or rabies. This game will put your trigonometry skills to the test, but more so your will to live. Why are these bunnies even angry? Did the foxes steal their easter eggs or did they just eat too many of their brethren? Too many plot holes. 9 out of 10. Kitten Squad. Now, with a name like that, I expected a cute, guilt-free adventure. But an oh-so-important detail I overlooked was that little PETA logo in the corner. Your kitten starts in this quaint little field where this crow tells us some unfun facts about the food industry. This mystical elk will set us off on our missions to save various animals from humanity. Your kitten will equip various firearms to take down culinary robots that stand between you and your objective. One mission, you might need to save a cow from the veal industry, and in another, you might infiltrate sea land to free an orca from their tanks. The gameplay is actually alright. Probably PETA's best game yet. It's also up to four players, so you and your friends can feel guilty together. Circle of Sumo is exactly as the title implies. A circle of sumo. Two to four wrestlers will duke it out to stay in the ring the longest. You can push, run, dash, reflect, and dodge your way to the top. Some of these stages are pretty comical and have some unique gimmicks that mix up your approach to each match. But overall, what you see is what you get, which is pretty bare bones in contrast to the sumos themselves. There's a ranked mode, but I can't find any opponents. So I'm just going to declare myself world champ by default. Fighting EX Slayer, Another Dash. That name sounds like a cry for help. We can't play online for free, but we do have access to the arcade mode. I've never been big on traditional fighting games, but it only took a few matches before I got most of my combos down. No, but really, I have no idea what's going on. Smash is the peak of my fighting game experience. Speaking of Smash, what is Terry Bogard doing here? In only half an hour, I completed Kyrie's campaign. And since I can't play online, I'm just gonna declare myself world champ by default. Onigiri. This is an MMORPG, or as I like to call it, Mamorpaga. Like any Mamorpaga, we start out by creating our own character. An average body male is probably most accurate, but you only live once, so I'm going muscular. Now for the name. Well, considering this is how I'm spending my Sunday, let's go with Rock Bottom. We get some basic combat training, and I'm already destroying this game's combo system. Before we can take on any massive threats, we'll need to travel off to the fields to farm some XP. Our character in his current state is so weak, he can't even keep a consistent frame rate. I found some Neopets and the map. Regardless of how I turn my character, my attacks always swipe away from the camera, which is really stupid design. Only 500 more hours of grinding and... Well, that seems like a good place to call it quits. So, that was a taste of the world of free games. The old adage appears to be true. You get what you pay for, and you really get what you don't pay for. When you look for games that lack financial value, they'll often unsurprisingly be reflected in their quality. There is a lot of garbage out there existing for the sake of existing, hoping that one day, someone will be insane enough to drop some cash. But there's also a surprising amount of quality experiences available if you take the time to seek them out. As long as you can refrain from buying those Rick and Morty Fortnite skins, you can have a lot of fun with no price of admission. Sir, are you going to order something or am I going to have to call the cops again? Uh, I got a coupon for a free appetizer. This coupon's expired.